introductions. So my name is, as I said, Benji, uh, or Benjamin Effinger. I am from America in a, t in a city called Nashville, Tennessee. It's a bit of a small, but it's very, very famous in America. It's very, very beautiful at night. When All right, so yes, gardens and sustainability. So I'll be talking about a couple things. So th I'll be talking a bit about the sustainable development goals, which are a very important topic right now. I'll also talk a little bit about garden styles and how gardens and sustainability are really important for one another. So first, I want to bring up four important vocabulary terms. I think everyone here is very uh, competent at English, but in case you've never seen some of these words, uh, topiary is a very important um, art style that uh, comes out of Western Europe. Although I, you do see quite a bit of topiary in Japan as well, especially with um, like pine trees. I think they trim it and make it a very beautiful shapes. And then also you have overgrown. So for example, in this photo, the vines are overgrowing and the wall is overgrown with vines. This is very important for English style gardens because English style gardens love the overgrown. <laughs> <laughs> Third is well-being. This is a really important topic right now in sustainability because, of course, we are worried about the environment, but we're also when worried about people's health and how they how they feel. So how can we make sure that we're caring for people and the environment? And then also, lastly, United Nations. Of course, United Nations is where um, the SDGs come from, which is the largest intergovernmental organization. I had the chance to visit the United Nations headquarters one time when I visited New York. If you guys ever get the chance, please go to the United Nations headquarters. It's really cool. Okay, so here's a small little uh, data point that's really cool. My home is in the United States, but um, in the UK, gardens occupy, oh, my, my internet's a bit unstable, sorry, I'll say that again. Gardens occupy between 432,964 and 521,872 hectares of UK land area. That's quite that's bigger than the size of London because they occupy such a large area and they can really help uh, ideas about sustainability. Furthermore, there is more gardens in there are more garden spaces in the United Kingdom than there are native forests. So these are really important places to conserve biodiversity and conserve plant and animals. Okay, so next the SDGs. I hope some of you guys have heard this or seen it. In Tokyo, they're everywhere. People have them on construction sites. People have them in the train stations. SDGs are becoming really, really important topic. They were established in 2015 during the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The agenda was where a lot of different countries came together and tried to talk it out. You know, what do we want to see by 2030? What kind of world do we want to live in? And from that, they made all of the sustainable development goals. So in a way, the sustainable development goals are what we want our future to look like. And it's really interesting to see how different nations thought about how the world should look. But of course, this is international. So it incorporates many different cultural elements. But on a practical sense, sustainable development goals are really useful. People will use them when they are designing a project or when they want to find opportunities to be more sustainable. So for example, I know that Daiwa House has looked at the sustainable development goals and tried to incorporate them into their design practices. When they build a building, they try to build it to be more sustainable according to the sustainable development goals. Other places and companies and organizations and even people do very similar things. In the United Kingdom, for example, they're trying to really limit the amount of carbon dioxide they're emitting and include and increase their amount of clean energy. 
which is one of the sustainable development goals. So here's a whole list of all 17. They're really interesting because some of them are really about the environment and some are just about people. So for example, no poverty is very, very human centered. It's about people less than about the environment. Zero hunger, good health and well-being. I think number one through number five are all about um, society. So for example, good health and well-being and gender equality are things that are meant for people and society. And then we start to move into economy. So for example, affordable and clean energy. This is about the environment, but it's really about the economy. Where do we want our energy to come from? Should it come from fossil fuels, which we do know are unsustainable, or do we want to try and find a way to do solar work? In Japan, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is the political party that uh, the Prime Minister Stuga is uh, the head of, made a pact to try to further this development goal by uh, promising to reach net zero, uh, net zero carbon emissions by, I believe, 2050. I believe it was 2050. It's really interesting as well, because you have a really controversial topic like reduced inequalities. Although it's quite broad, it's really interesting that they were able to include this in the sustainable development goals. And I think this really tells us that sustainability is about people just as much, if not more, than it is about the environment. Of course, you also have climate action, which is really important nowadays, especially as we are moving into the last years where we can actually cause change. Life below water, life on land. And then the last two are very political. Of course, we want peace. And of course, we want to help each other and work with each other to achieve the goals. So here's how sustainable development goals are important or how gardens are important for sustainable development goals. So for example, plants sequester CO2. Sequester is a weird word. We use it when something is taken and stored. So for example, um, a puddle sequesters water because it holds it for a long time, but that's a bit of a weird use. So we use things when it's stored for a purpose. So for example, plants sequester CO2 and the purpose is climate action. This is a really good word when we're talking about resources and other things in science. Second, so goal 15, life on land, is all about animals and plants. And gardens are great because they provide habitat for plants and animals, especially in cities. I know in Tokyo, there aren't many gardens because there's so little space available. But the gardens that are there are really important for maintaining plants and animals. And you can probably find plenty of plants and animals in the small gardens that are all around Tokyo. Third is good health and well-being. It's kind of crazy, but one of the really great ways to increase someone's mental health is by taking them to a green place. So for example, a public park or a garden. And right now in Japan, South Korea, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, mental health is a really big issue. People are facing problems like depression or anxiety quite often. So maybe, well, not maybe, we know gardens can help people increase their mental health and their well-being. And so gardens are important for number three as well. And then number 11 is really quite fascinating. Sustainable cities and communities. Around 80 to 5% of Japan lives in cities. And so if 85% of the population doesn't have access to green space, their mental health and well-being will actually decrease. And if there isn't green space in, in, in a city, things like floods will happen because the water has nowhere to go. Gardens are great for this because water can go into the garden and right through the soil into the groundwater supply. Groundwater is the water you get from, that, uh, from underneath the soil. So for example, if you have a well, it'll access groundwater below. So the gardens are really important for sustainable cities. 
and they're important for uh, avoiding disasters like floods. I know that New York has had a really hard time recently with floods. And one of the ways that people have considered fixing the New York flood problem is by putting more green places in, like parks or gardens. So here is where my research is really interested. I'm fascinated by different styles of gardens. I'm also really interested on how different styles of gardens impacts people's mental health and well-being differently. So for example, you have the English style garden. If anybody's ever been to England, you've probably have seen something like this before. English style gardens are unique because they like overgrown styles. They like wild plants all over the place, climbing vines, wild flowers, uh, large trees. This is a really unique thing about England. And unlike other European styles, you'll never find any hard lines in English style gardens. And that's because English style really likes the idea of the natural look, like here. So this style specifically is called cottage style, English cottage style. And then obviously this is Kendokuen, which is in Kanazawa, if anybody has been to Kanazawa, it's beautiful. And this is the Japanese style. The Japanese style is also <laughs> really unique. They try to resemble nature. They try to make it very pristine, very beautiful. This is kind of Japanese style topiary, isn't it? Where they've shaped the bush into looking like a sphere. But the most unique thing about Japan, Japanese style gardens is how important water is. In an English style garden, you'll very rarely find any water, especially not a large pond, because that's so much space. But in Japan, almost every Japanese style garden will have either a small body of water, like running water to make a sound or a large pond in the middle to look across. And it's quite beautiful and it's really unique. And then the third style I'd like to tell you about is the French style. This is the Palace of Versailles in Versailles, France. And it's really different from the English style because they like it to look very hard. You don't want uh, different plants to meet. Every single plant is divided. They don't touch. But they really like topiary. They really, really, really like topiary. Um, if you go to a French garden, you may see the most unique topiary ever. I've seen topiary of, if you, if you know um, uh, Serena Williams, the English uh, the English athlete, there was topiary designed to look like her face. It was crazy. They also really like symmetry. Symmetry is when you have, for example, two different shapes that if you cut them in half, they look the exact same on either side. If you take a line down this garden, it looks the exact same. What's really cool about each of these styles <laughs> is they have different impacts on mental health. So the English style makes people feel relaxed. It makes people feel at ease with life. And it's really good for stress. The Japanese style is really interesting because it helps people have inspiration. It makes them feel, for example, artistic. A lot of people, a lot of artists in Japan will go to Japanese style gardens trying to think, okay, what can I paint next? What is the music I'm trying to make right now? And that's partially because of the really uh, sensory experiences. So sensory experiences are like colors or sounds because Japanese style likes those kinds of things, running water or beautiful, uh, we call them maples, but momichi in Japanese. And the French style is weird because it makes people feel weak. It's actually bad for mental health because of all the harsh lines. It's really good if you're a king and you want your subjects to feel weak and powerless, but it's bad if you're a peasant, a regular person, because you feel weak and powerless. All right, so that's all that I wanted to talk about for my actual research. It's very introductory, it's very, very small, but I'm hoping you can learn some things. But next, I was hoping we might be able to talk to one another 
about gardens, sustainability, or other things. So let me stop sharing my screen right now. All right, so I had a couple questions I wanted to ask people and see if you have any experiences like this. Has anybody ever been to a Japanese, an English, or a French-style garden before in Japan or abroad? 